<laughs> All right, so welcome to this third day. Uh, we, we did the velocity and variety separately, right? So what we are going to do now is uh, to, to see that uh, putting them together is very challenging and is what I've been trying to do in the last seven years. And I branded the solution that I'm proposing, which is not the solution, I mean, it's just my solution, stream reasoning. And we will actually present you, I will present you my approach which is one of the way you can implement stream reasoning. You should be aware that there are more groups around that did different things, okay? And they are not presented here. Huh? So it's uh, something much larger than what can be presented in uh, one hour and a half. We are going to give uh, a full day tutorial on this topic uh, at the International Semantic Web Conference uh, in two days from now, okay? So it, it really takes uh, a while to present the, the current state of the art. So, you probably remember this slide, right? So it was uh, presenting several scenarios where there was velocity. Um, you, if you try to, to remember the images, you will see that some of them are similar, others are different. And indeed, I, I will claim that uh, even when I was using the OIL platform as an example of sensor network, it was uh, already much more than only velocity, okay? So here I bring you use cases that I've been working on in, uh, in my research. So I, I was working with uh, Statoil, which is a Norwegian oil company. And uh, now I'm working with ENI, which is the Italian oil and gas company. Um, my, most of my research paper normally talk about smart cities. Okay, so that's why I put smart city there. Uh, global content center is something that we did with uh, Indra, which is a Spain company that um, is basically doing uh, the call centers of Telefonica. Okay? So when I write global content center, actually I'm thinking to, to this company that offers uh, services to global scale uh, com telco company and social network, of course, you know, right? So, Again, those generate streams and those create uh, reactive answers. The big difference with regards to what I wrote yesterday, for instance, for the oil company, is that there I'm writing something which uh, is not only looking at one specific flow of information. Right? Here the question is, what is the expected time to failure when uh, the tarbing barring starts to vibrate as detected in the last 10 minutes? Mm? So there is this uh, in the last 10 minutes uh, and this implication that either you answer in 10 minutes or you will, so the reactiveness is still there. But here you see that we are looking for a given type uh, of uh, uh, mechanism that is part of a larger mechanism and it, we are looking to some historical information, right? So it is vibrating uh, as detected, but what does that mean? Unless you have further information that, you, that will explain you what that vibration means, you cannot interpret it, okay? So that's the difference. I will dig it more, okay? But yesterday was simply, I have uh, tons of sensor, they are homogeneous, and I bring them together. Here I'm pointing to more complex heterogeneities where complex domain models that are, re are required to do correct interpretation are somehow implied. Eh? I will, in any case, elaborate on it. Um, the question of smart city that I'm really fascinated because it's terribly simple when you put it there. Is public transportation where the people are? But if you think, it's terribly hard to answer. Okay? Where are the people is per se very difficult. Hmm? So how do I know where the people are? Okay? I may use cell phone, I may use social network, but I mean all of them are only partial. Huh? So there is really a, a lack of data. Huh? And of course, what does public transportation mean? If you are in Italy, you're quite lucky because we have public company that offer them. But think of London, okay? So London have tens of different uh, company that operate the public transports. And now you also have these things like Uber there that are also offering a kind of public transport, right? So organizing this and making sure that you do on the flying public transportation planning is something that I call stream reasoning uh, as a problem. Um, if you think about this uh, global contact center, you realize that uh, there is uh, half, a half a billion people okay, there as a customer of these uh, companies, and potentially they can start calling contact center around the world for problems that are completely heterogeneous. Huh? And what you want is giving them the best agent to answer the, uh, 
the specific reason, okay? And you want this to be minimal in time, but also appropriate to the kind of customer. Uh, so there is a customer that are business customer. If you piece off one of them, you may risk 10,000 phone numbers going away. And there are others like us that even if uh, you don't respond to that quickly, who cares? It's just one, okay? So there is a not so easy problem to solve. And um, yesterday I was saying it's very interesting to know which are the trending topics on one social network. But what about asking across social networks? Huh? So I want to listen to all the social pulses and I want to make sense of them all together. Okay, so some of them come as these images from Instagram, others come as tests from Facebook and Twitter. Maybe others are stream of video that come from things like Periscope. Okay, and I want to make sense of all of them huh, at once. So, being more detailed, okay, I'm saying that there is massive data, okay. So in the oil, a platform which is not, I mean, that stuff that is just there upon the sea is also what is under the sea and it can spread around for 10 kilometers, okay, is equipped with 100,000 of sensors. Huh? So the, the use case that I was working on at the something like 400 different sensors, instances of 100,000 different sensors. Mm -hmm. Then, um, in this smart city setting, you can easily have millions of points, okay? So think about Milano. Milano is, is a city with something like 700,000 people, but every day there are at least one million people coming in, doing job, and then going out every day, okay? They, are, they commute in and out. Yeah? So do in the, center of the day, easily you have almost 2 million people inside the city. Um, Global Santa Center, I was saying before, uh, a company like Telefonica can have half a billion people, okay, as a customer base. And Facebook, of course, that, that eats the billions, okay. This number probably is a couple of years old. Nowadays it should be 1.5 billion people on Facebook, active, uh, that do things every moment. Then, there is this uh, data streams. Here I'm putting a bit of numbers just to, to make it more concrete. Uh, so those 400 sensors, 400,000 sensors, normally they create something like 10,000 observations hmm, because most of them are simply switch off. Uh, they do not uh, send anything because they are turned on when something happens. Hmm. So this sensor network normally care about uh, power consumption. Uh, so most of the sensors are simply off and they are turned on when something that must be detected becomes important. And so you have the bad news that uh, the more it's critical, the, the task that you have to do, the more information you have. Okay? And that actually happens also in the other settings. And so uh, in the global contact center, for instance, it's quite normal to have something like 10,000 contacts per minute okay, at, um, out of these uh, half a billion people. But when something becomes problematic, they can pick up quite easily. Yeah? So you have a breakdown in uh, somewhere in um, South America, okay? That can be something like uh, an entire fibrotics that connects to city goes off, okay? And so you have the entire city that has a problem. They all call, okay? They all call, all together. Um, in the, the Milano settings, I was putting numbers that I will bring on again later on. So those are the number of uh, calls, SMS, internet access that you have every minute fr from the city, okay? And yes, th that's a scary number. Three million people press I like every minute, okay? So if you want to simply make sense of uh, aggregate them, okay? So what do they like? Do they like sport? Do they like food? Do they like... So it's not such an easy task in any case. Um, then I was saying heterogeneity, okay, so variety. And the source of variety in these different settings are different, but m all of them are a re real problem that you cannot solve by saying we put a standard. Okay? Think about the OI platform. There are standards, you get information in a standard way. The problem is that there are tens of standards. Okay, and the reason, of course, is they are deployed across time, and at the time when they did the sensor, it was standard, then the standard evolved, and so it's no longer a standard, it's the standard version something, right? Um, in the smart city setting, it's more easy to see the problem of variety. None of the data are actually produced for your goal. 
So there are transportation data, mobile phone data, social media data. The fact that you want to put them together is just because you have this idea that they are capturing the reality. But indeed, they were produced for a completely different reason. Yeah? So of course, they are, they are different. In the global content center, one says, here there is no variety, right? I mean, I own the content center. Why shall I put variety in? The problem is that it's not like that. Huh? So a global contact center in reality is one thin layer of uh, nothing that hires local contact centers that uh, are there in order to do something that matters in that moment. Uh, so you are going to launch a new tariff uh, in a given part of the world. You set up a contact center with enough people for enough time to handle the problem. Then you will resize it, you will have another contract. So this sub-contact center actually keep changing, okay? And therefore, you have variety. Um, yes, and in the social media world, you probably understand it easily, so I don't want to argue about it. Then, these data are incomplete. And in the sensor network, they are incomplete because sensor broke down. In the social media, sorry, in the smart city, because they were not meant to be complete. Okay, so there is no reason why you should think that you have all the data. Um, in the global contact center, is because there are a number of things that are digitalized, but there are also a number of things that are not digitalized. And so, for instance, every contact person has to write a report after the phone call. So yeah, he has to say, I was contacted by him when there is a filler, and uh, the problem was you have to describe it, and then I solve it in this way. I didn't solve it. Uh, I, the people hang up. Okay? So partially it's a form, partially it's written stuff. And when the operator is not uh, I mean, willing to, to complete this form or is tired, the information is incomplete. Right? So that, that's standard. And um, luckily, I would say, in social network, uh, we do not capture all the conversations. And so there is a lot of conversation that goes on and is not on social network, right? So you can never say, oh, I'm seeing this and this is reality. You're seeing what people want to share with you, okay? There is an amount of things that are happening that are not shared and you will never see them. So you should not say, this is reality. This is what people want to share with me, okay? The rest is there. And I don't know if I will ever be able to, to pulse it, to take the pulse. It. And they are noisy. Huh? Here I'm using the term noisy in a very a vogue way. Huh? So depending on the set of this, uh, should become different. Okay, so when I say noisy in terms of sensor, I really mean the noise. Huh? So that sensor is out of range and is not giving me the right information. When I say um, Noisy in terms uh, of global content center, I mean something different. Uh, so these people talk to other people, they may, they may misunderstand, they may decide that they don't want to deal with that customer and simply they give a the wrong answer. Okay, so somehow th that is a different kind of noise. And when I say noise in social networks, I mean that uh, our own tools can produce wrong data. Uh, so if I use a uh, sentiment mining, I may say this is a, a, a fantastic sentence. Right? It's, it's very positive and actually is a negative sentence because it's uh, written in, a, in an ironic way uh, or very sarcasm in the people that uh, I've written I've them. Uh? So in that sense, you are introducing noise uh, inside the, the signal yourself. Okay, I was already saying this, uh, so reactive answers, minutes uh, to decide what to do with uh, the oil platform. Even in the uh, smart city where one may say, okay, why shall I have a reactive answer? Because in that specific setting, mm -hmm. the one of mobile transport, you see that you are in front of your phone and, and your competitor is Google, right? You give answer in few milliseconds, hundreds of, hundreds of milliseconds. So normally, if you put an, an, an innovative service, you have to answer in few seconds. Uh, even if it should take more, right? People expect it to, to take few seconds because everything is somehow in few seconds nowadays, right? So that, that is the, the thing. And um, in the global content center, the problem is that you are going through decision trees, and every step of a decision tree does must take few seconds because otherwise you wait at the listen to music for minutes. Okay, so a standard decision tree has something like. 200 decision between you calling and the routing that brings you to an agent, to an, a voice uh, um, 
uh, a voice, a text to a text to speech that tells you something, or a speech to text that uh, try to to grasp what you are saying. Okay, so if you take minutes every decision no, the, the decision point in this tree, then the, the person will stay there listening for music for 20 minutes, right? Makes no sense. And yes, in the uh, social network, things change so fast that probably even their minutes is the, the time to give reactive answers. And normally, you don't want aggregation only. Okay, so you want fine-grained answers. You want exactly that turbine that may have a problem. You want exactly the bus that you want to take to go from here to there. You want exactly the agent, okay? And that is one among 20,000 people. Okay, so you should not, it's not just I want to aggregate. You want fine-grained information. And as I was saying before, in many cases, the interpretation goes through something which is not obvious. Uh, there is a very complex domain model that is normally in the head uh, of the operators that is used to interpret the data. Uh, so think about this uh, old platform. Uh, whenever they have to take a decision, they have volumes of environmental regulation that says, uh, if you put one drop of oil into the sea, we, we do, there's, nothing, there's no problem. If you put 10 drops, then you may, uh, you may run into this risk with that fish. And if you put 100, then you create this damage at the entire ecosystem, right? So it's, it's not a small body of knowledge, and that is just the environmental part. Then there are all the processes that this company has, which is very complex. So you have to produce as much oil as possible in given time frame because of that and that reasons, ships going around, prices changing, right? So, um, if you think about smart city, there are so many different aspects in our life and probably all of them are important when you have to, to do this kind of smart city services. And in the contact centers, there are agent skills, type of contracts, uh, different uh, uh, Profiles of those that call, and all of them, okay, must be considered when you take this routing decision in the decision trees. And yes, if you go on social networks, there, of course, every single topic of discussion is potentially something that you have to understand, right? Otherwise, you you miss the the, the conversation. So, wrapping up this very long set of requirements, okay, I was talking about massive data sets that in big data set terms are volume. I was talking about uh, uh, data streams that you have to process on the fly, which is the velocity dimension. Heterogeneity, uh, which is the variety. Then something that uh, unfortunately is there, the data are incomplete, and that is both a problem of variety so maybe the data set can complement each other, so indeed it's not something that you should worry too much about. But sometimes it's a problem of veracity. So the data are incomplete and also inconsistent. The noise, that is a veracity problem. The reactive answers, which are velocity again. The fine grained information access that apply both to volume and to velocity and the domains, right? And the domains uh, are, sorry, the, the X is in, in the wrong position, uh, is a variety problem, right? So it's, a, it's another source of information, very complex that you have to consider when you want to process the information. Um, you remember those, right? Mm -hmm. So if that is the trade-off, uh, adding variety can only make it worse, but definitely if you can solve a variety challenge, you will create a lot of value. Okay, so let's see if you can make it. Hmm? So how do you address this? You remember, right? So if it is velocity, what you do, you do this paradigmatic change, you bring in these infinite data streams, then you think about it and you say, okay, they are infinite, but indeed there is an opportunity to forget, there is an opportunity to use the data while they come. Okay, and in that sense, uh, you come up with this idea that uh, you can register the query, so you don't ask query on the fly, you, you register them, data pass by, and while they pass by, you look at them through a window and you generate a stream of answer. Okay, so th that is the state of the art. And uh, if you 
take uh, the requirements and you put ticks for the state of the art, you see that uh, you treat massive data set with them, you treat uh, data streams, uh, they are robust with regard to noise. So yesterday we were talking about sampling techniques, load shedding techniques. Uh, there is also all, all a, a topic on uncertainty in complex event processing that is treated and understood. Um, they provide uh, reactive answers and they are very fine grain, right? So yesterday you saw that you can go down to check whether that specific uh, combination of smoke and high temperature should generate one N or N alarms, right? So you can really go down to the small details if you want. But if you have uh, 10 streams, uh, you can put them in one single model by doing adaptation and you treat it. But if you start having a hundred different streams, a thousand different streams, then you, do, you no longer do it. Okay? So heterogeneity per se is not uh, um, solved with a uh, data stream management system and complex event processors. You can solve it, right? You encode everything in one single model through adaptation. Okay? But that's just a trick. Then second, Probably yes. Good, perfect. Um, then these data are incomplete, okay? And if you have incomplete data or source of data that can complement each other, this technology will not solve it. It's not out of the box that incomplete data can be combined and uh, fit together. And the last point is when you start to have very complex domain models, you see that it's terribly hard uh, to use uh, complex event processing. Uh, so yesterday we were saying smoke plus high temperature fire. Okay? But what if you have a, a real situation? Uh, think about the, um, the case that you want uh, to check if the speed of every single vehicle on every single street uh, is correct. Okay? Now you have to start thinking. There are a number of different streets, there are a number of different uh, vehicles, and there are a number of different speed limits that apply to combination of streets uh, and vehicles. Right? So if you have a car, you can go, go to some speed. If you have a truck, you should go a different one. If you have a bicycle, it should be different. Okay? And what about weather conditions? Uh, so in Italy, at least, we have speed limits that change according to the weather conditions. Right? So if you start encoding them, you can do it. Okay? So you start saying, if it is uh, a car and it is not raining and it is on a highway, the speed limit is. And if it is, uh, but you see that you, you will never end. And if you want to do a change, it's terrible because you have to go find exactly the rule that is wrong and change it. Right? It would be much nicer to have a model that represents uh, the speed, uh, the, the street regulations, and then you simply write one single rule. Check if uh, the vehicles are traveling at a speed which is not good for the, spe for the specific road and weather condition. And the rest is done automatically. Right? That will be the dream. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, Pramod will handle, uh, you know, discuss complex data domain models. Perfect. So it kind of complements some of the other things you. Right. So Very good. So, is is there something that uh, can help? Huh? Yesterday we were talking. No, the day before we were talking about. Uh, uh, ontology-based data access as a way to treat variety, you remember? Uh, so you have one single query, a complex model that goes down in a set of different queries that will get the answer, right? So indeed, if this was a static context, you can encode the road uh, regulation as an ontology, you can write your single query here on top of the ontology, and the magic here will create all the different queries, right? That will combine weather condition type of vehicles. No, that, that is doable, okay? So if you take that and you put it here, it, it does treat heterogeneity, and that work with incomplete data because you can mix up the data from different data sources and fill the all that are in one with uh, information which is in another one and definitely they do complex domain models okay Th that is what uh, this technology comes from luckily enough uh, uh, they can provide you fine grain information access uh, so they are, no they are not just for uh, aggregation they work for fine grain information access and in modern days they were extended to work uh, with massive data okay so if you go back seven years 
it was the time where Semantic Web didn't prove at all to be able to scale. Okay, but then people start doing ontology-based attacks, start doing materialization on a dupe, and they show that indeed they can scale. Okay, so volume is no longer a problem here. But data streams are not there, or at least we're not there. Noisy data are a problem because you are in a logic framework. You don't want noise in a logic framework. And uh, reactive answer normally is not possible, right? I mean, even if uh, ontology-based data access brings this time down, uh, if you have to load the data in a database before you, you can use that technology, it will never work. Right? Because that is the paradigmatic change that you have to do to treat velocity. So what we did was uh, making it uh, a research question, right? So seven years ago, together with uh, Frank Van Armel and Stefano Ceri, which is my boss in Politecnico, and Dieter Frenzel, we wrote down this sentence, okay? So we, will want, we want to try to make sense in real time of multiple heterogeneous, gigantic, and inevitably noisy and incomplete data streams in order to support the decision processes of an extremely large number of concurrent users. Okay, that, that was the sentence that we wrote down. And to show that this was doable, together with uh, Heiner, what we did was uh, coming up with this uh, drawing. Okay, we said, indeed, uh, if you try to push data streams into a reasoner, it will never work. Okay, why? Because uh, normally expressive stream reasoning is expressive reasoning is too complex. Okay, so you have to be aware that uh, up here it will never work. It may work down here where you are in the space of query answering. Okay, AC0 is the space of answering a, a conjunctive query over data. But on the other side, probably you don't want to send high frequency data into the reasoner. What you want to do is to come up with some solution that will abstract the data and only throw up to reasoners changes that are less frequent. Okay, and so basically the intuition that we had was if we can take re very complex reasoning tasks and make sure that they are sort of encoded as queries on, on, on an ontological model. And then those queries can be encoded as uh, via rewriting, okay, as SQL queries or SQL query in this specific setting, okay, that goes down into raw data stream, then maybe we can do it. Because most of the tasks will be simply run within the velocity technology. Okay? So w whenever you can solve it as something which is compiled down to things that work on data stream, do it. Only if uh, there is a situation that uh, you, you have to treat differently, then you do what is called interpretation and you move one level up. But in doing that, you select a subset of the data, or you create an event which is the result of a number of small fine-grained events. Okay, so you, you do what yes, you saw to be a, a, the loop back, right? And so you move one level up, you reduce the frequency, and you have now a semantic event. Okay, and that one can be further selected and further abstracted, and so you can go on with this idea, okay? And later on, you will have a frequency that are good for uh, changes, uh, even if you throw things inside the reason. And so that is the intuition that we had. Not saying that we, we made it, okay? So this is still a sort of partial dream, but uh, many of these building blocks are built. Huh? And to make it doable, what uh, I did was to break it down in smaller questions. So the first one was, uh, um, can we take the semantic web stack and extend it so that uh, data streams, continuous query, and continuous reasoning tasks uh, are represented in this stack? Uh, because the, the standard stack is one-time semantics and does not treat uh, data streams, does not have continuous query, and of course doesn't have any idea of what continuous reasoning is. put the DL at the top, but really there can be a lot of other things at the top. And there's a lot more potentially of statistical oh, yes. uh, model you know, on the top. And putting DL there uh, probably limits the scope too much. I perfectly agree. 
If I had to, I mean, this is from 2010, and I put it there. If no, I have to redo it nowadays. But it is also with some of the semantic we have done in the context of semantics. Absolutely. Uh, but if I had to redo it now, for instance, here you can put Bison network, here you can put uh, answer set programming. There is much more that you can put here. Uh, and I, I saw people doing it. And so, fortunately, Pramodil exactly discussed that. Uh, perfect. Several statistical models that he has used. The, the, very, very good. Similar things. So, very, very good. good. We are getting one view. And this is clearly has some application, but we're also going to get uh, uh, things dealing with very noisy data and a lot of, you know, uh, things. Very good. Because I would say that my stuff on noisy data doesn't work that much. Yeah, and that's <laughs> he has to do that, yeah. Of course, because it's fully built on logic. So. Perfect. Then the second thing that uh, I did was uh, to, to say, OK, we, we can extend it. Eh? It's just a modeling problem. OK, but then we, we have to make sure that this works. Otherwise, uh, OK, we did a nice model, but it's, it's completely throw away. Huh? So what we start doing was optimizing continuous query, optimizing continuous reasoning in order to provide reactive answers. Huh? So th that is the second thing that uh, I did with my colleagues. Then I tried hard what uh, <laughs> Amit was uh, pointing us to. So I mean, one should not forget that in reality, data are noisy and incomplete. So we need to do something. What I tried was combining semantic web and machine learning. Uh, that is what I, you will see later on here. The, the, the interesting thing is that um, by putting DL at, the DL at the top and talking about the DL-centric reasoning, you're only capturing one very small, narrow part of the kind of applications that it can support. I agree. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other ones uh, where you know, to do that. Yeah, it was very nice yes, to so do this. Complex, <laughs> yeah, noisy and those kind of stuff. Yeah. Indeed. And um, the last one is uh, okay, but if all of this is just a, a nice theoretical frame, I'm not happy. So I, I want to show that there are practical cases where this is the solution. Okay, at, at least it's adequate. And if it is not the solution, at least it's one of the possible solutions. So, starting from the first one. Um, you, you remember RDF, you saw it two days ago. <laughs> the, the general idea is that you try to encode uh, every single uh, piece of information on Earth in triples. Uh, so there is this subject, predicate, object, expression. And they may capture anything. Here I'm capturing the idea that Barack Obama a number of years ago said uh, four more years, right? So that is one thing that you can write in triples. Um, more broadly, all, all of them together make a graph. And the difference between a graph and RDF is that uh, there are labels. Uh, so the nodes are labeled, the arch are labeled, and you can use these labels uh, to do some tasks. Uh, some of them can be very simple, like querying. Others can be more sophisticated, like reasoning. And um, when you start thinking about uh, this, the, the size of this graph, okay, you realize that can be huge. Uh, for instance, uh, that specific tweet uh, was retweeted something like, uh, uh, it's not big. Oh, yes, it was retweeted something like eight, 800,000 times. Uh, it was uh, favorited by 300,000 tweets. So there is a, a social network, which is a graph. You can represent it. And this is a single node that is linked uh, to a huge amount of points in this network. So it's a sort of time evolving network that you want to capture and analyze. Yeah? That, that is the, the kind of data model that is behind. So what we did was uh, try to come up with a notion of RDF stream. Okay? And we did it in the easiest of the possible ways. Yeah? So we said uh, in uh, the early days of uh, data stream management system, people say you can do it with one timestamp that represent the time of um, the time that the, the data enter the system that has to answer okay and that is the timestamp that we had after the triple huh? here one may say why didn't you use reification why didn't you use that and there was uh, time aware RDF and blah 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 okay the only point here is we want to be reactive and if you start doing very fancy things that may look very nice from a theoretical perspective, they will never work uh, from an engineering perspective. This is very naive, okay? 
but it works. And if you think later on, a eh, couple of years ago, when they did RDF uh, 1.1, they allowed this as one of the building blocks of RDF. Eh? So nowadays, you can put uh, anything as a context. It can even be a literal. Eh? So ba basically, you can, it can even be an, an, a blank node. Eh? So you can have a graph which has uh, as identifier a blank node. Okay, so indeed this was uh, quite interesting at, at that time. And given that you now have RDF streams, you can take Sparkle and you can add continuous feature to it. Mm? So this that you are looking at is a continuous Sparkle query that answer potentially, okay, the query, who are the opinion makers? And is doing it by saying, you are an opinion maker if uh, when you state something, somebody else that follows you state the same. Uh, that, that is the kind of query that is implemented here. Uh, um, apart from the Sparkle part of it, that um, is not so important, uh, I want to highlight that we have uh, a registration clause, right? Because you have to go to continuous semantics, query must be registered. Okay, so you, there is this register. Then you want to create stream out, uh, so you register a stream, okay, because the answer of a query will be a new stream that you can further process, and uh, you give it a name. Then you need to eat stream. So among the possible data sets that you can input, you now have a from stream clause that allow you to point to a stream. Okay, that is uh, the, the way we did it. You have a window clause. So I want to open on this stream a window which is half an hour wide and that moves on every five minutes. Okay, and then. What we did was uh, taking a sort of intermediate position between pure data stream management system and complex event processor. Uh, so in pure data stream management system, you have no access to timestamp. Mm? And the reason is very good. We realize it uh, years later when we try to optimize uh, this specific function. Okay? If you allow the application to access the timestamp, then you have a lot of information to, to, to work with. Okay, and it was very smart for Jennifer Whedon to say no. Okay, because when they build stream, they simply said no. And that is a fantastic optimization. Every time you receive the same piece of information, is a duplicate, you throw it away. Because you will never access the duplicates, right? Unless you have a timestamp. So it's a way to reduce the dimensionality of the data, not giving access to the timestamp. Very cool. But if you give access, then you can give uh, the power of complex event processing without uh, giving the operators. In, yep. in the case when uh, the same it's something um, uh, same message is forwarded, like uh, would it be considered as a new message or the same message? If you give access to the timestamp, it is considered as uh, a new message. Yeah, but in the traditional thing, in traditional case, no, it's, it no. is you they shade. So a, a message which is in the in the window that uh, is uh, somehow. <laughs> renewed by a message of the same kind that comes will somehow be uh, forgotten, right? So, so you can forget whatever enters the window and is already in the window. So suppose I have a window in the afternoon mm -hmm. and I'm getting the stream of uh, weather-related data as a temperature. Right. And the temperature is here at 34 degrees, it goes 35 and then comes back to 34. Uh -huh. Now what happens to the previous 34? The yeah, but that, okay, but th that is because you are not imagining the, the data model in the correct way. So in that sense, you probably will have uh, the sensor, the moment when uh, the, the information was recorded and the value. Okay. Right. So that, that, by the way, it's a very so interesting question. Having different features of apparently yeah, of exactly. So this, uh, this is uh, the time when you receive a triple. Nobody prevents you to have the time in the triple, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you need the time in the triple because otherwise you don't have a time series. If you need to analyze the time series, you, you need to represent it. Okay. Yeah, but that is interesting. Huh? So you can have time here, you can have time here, and you have operators that operate on this time, and you have standard Sparkle that operate on the time represented as data. Yeah? And this is not obvious. Eh? And definitely, again, when Jennifer Whedon said, don't give uh, the timestamp, she was smart because it, that does not cause problem that we have when we, uh, we ask people encode this query. Because there are at least two ways always to encode it. Use the time that comes as a data or use the time that uh, is the time when you receive the information. Eh? Mm -hmm. And this can be different. Eh? When we get in our 
scenarios tweets. Tweets come with a time, which is uh, so Twitter send you tweets that are delayed by even minutes. So sometimes when there is a lot of information, you receive out of order tweets. And of course, we completely ignore the time as a data, because otherwise it will be a problem to treat it. But that would say that when you give a number, I receive 22 tweets in the last 10 minutes. What if I count how many of them were tweeted in the last 10 minutes? You may discover eight. Right? Because one was tweeted in the, in the window that was already gone, and one is tweeted in a window that is not already here. Now, because that also that can happen. A tweet sends you things that are somehow a few seconds up front uh, the current time. And that is because uh, maybe they come from a server that is on the other side of the world and the time is not aligned. Uh, and by the time it traverses the network, uh, it is somehow in front of you instead of back. Thank you for the question, Amit. It's, uh, it's really a problem, that one. Um, it's a problem for databases. Huh? So it's, it's not really a problem from us. It's uh, something that is known and uh, master it is very difficult. Huh? So you have to take several decisions when you design it. However, what we did was give him this access, and that allows you to do some of the sequence. Huh? So in this case, I'm saying if the follower is uh, saying it after the opinion maker, count it. If it is saying in before, then don't count it. That is the kind of uh, thing that is written here. Okay, then what about reasoning? Okay, so this is sparkle plus uh, continuous semantics. The case of reasoning is well illustrated here. So in this kind of query, what we want to do is to have a simple way to compute the impact of a given tweet. And let's say that we say that there is an impact of the tweet if the tweet uh, is discussed, mm? directly or indirectly. Mm? That means that uh, if you have this uh, Alice that posts something and then there is another tweet that discusses it, a tweet that discusses this one, no? you can create chains of them. Okay? In a more I mean, sophisticated social network, you may have even multiple branches that discuss across uh, a network. So here, here is a tree, but it can be a lactis uh, without uh, too, too much problem. Mm? And now I would like to be able to write what I wrote there. Okay? I want to say Alice, post, and then there is discussions. Okay? And I don't want to actually check discuss at one op, discuss at two op, discuss at three op, discuss at four op, because in that sense I will write an infinite query, right? Yeah. If I have to write all the possibilities, the only thing that I can do is to keep adding, and then I will say, of course, in uh, my hour there, not, there cannot be more than 10, 20, 100 discussion, and if there are, I don't care. Right? That is the only way you can encode it uh, without recursion. Hmm? So if you say post is transitive, you have done, right? Because then you expect the system to do this for you. Huh? So it creates the, the closure, and then you just have to count. Huh? So there is uh, the direct ones, one and two, and then there are three, and then the indirect one. Huh? So four, five, six, seven, right? Mm? So th that is the power that we were willing to give uh, to the user, that we are able to write very abstract query, okay, and then delegate uh, the task of coming up with the answer to some automatic system that knows the semantics uh, of uh, the things that we write there. Uh, so in this sense, this is a, a terrible complex example. Right? So it looks very easy, but if you ask a machine to do it at scale, this is terrible. Uh, because that, that kind of things can be very complex, and you cannot predict their size, so they can explode easily. Yeah? OK. So, yeah. In, the, in, in, in a sense, um, if your basic computation requires computing for graphs or, uh, you know, horn clauses or description logic, uh, uh, logic based reasoner, it's going to be incredibly slow compared to. If your basic computation is mapped into, let's say, matrix computation or, you know, vector computation or something along that line, so I, I think agree. it all, you know, depends on how do you, you know, transform this into the, yeah. uh, you know, underlying core computational model. I agree. I agree. So what we did here was, uh, I mean, 
simply trying to solve it with rule-based reasoning. Mm. But nowadays, for instance, uh, we, we are trying to use vector databases mm. to do things that you will see in my next talk. Okay. Okay, so, and we are also trying to use a time series database to solve other problems that we, are, we run into. And definitely, this is fully based on materialization. Whereas if I had to do it again, I would do it fully based on query rewriting. writing. So the underlying system is what I target, and I must be able to take my problem, break it down in pieces, and send the part that goes to vector databases to vector database, the part that goes to graph database to graph database, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So that I can actually delegate computation to the best of a possible solution, mm -hmm. and then I have uh, only the task to do integration. Mm -hmm. So that was envisioned in the pyramid, mm -hmm. but in reality, as I said, it, it, it's partially done by some groups. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Along that line yeah. That, um, what underlying infrastructure you think should be used for this? I mean, so so if I explain more my question, that um, uh, let's say if I'm using a database, uh, any graph database or a virtual, so for this, uh, the biggest content, the biggest problem with that is if I'm updating it too much, creating index would take really exactly. long time. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what's your view? What should we use for this? Should we use database at all, or should we create our own underlying infrastructure? Right. Uh, so I can tell you what we did, which works. So much before these people from SAP invented the concept of uh, in-memory database and made it the best thing on earth, we said, why don't we use uh, in-memory graphs? Okay, in-memory graphs are terribly fast. So what we are doing is, uh, so the, the things that you saw the first day, they are fully built on uh, in-memory representation. We actually use GINA, okay, nothing terribly complex, but we keep it in memory. So we buy virtual machines that have uh, 20 gigabyte of memory, 36 gigabyte of memory, and we can process big flows, right? So th that is one way. I'm not saying that is the best way, it's one way. Then there is people that actually did it in a different way, which is rewriting to complex event processors. They did it in a sort of naive way, but that also is an idea because you don't want to store the data, okay? Otherwise, it will not be velocity, okay? So that is one possibility. Uh, relational streaming, you rewrite the query as a continuous query in some underlying relational language, and then at most you get the RDF stream out if you want it. Otherwise, you simply generate RDF stream, okay? And that is somehow envisioned by my parameter, right? So it's the row stream in, at the bottom that gets row stream in and generate row stream out. Huh? That is, is a possibility. Um, then there is the group uh, uh, in IBM Dublin that did an implementation on uh, InforceField stream, which is a distributed system. Okay, so in that sense, they took the best of a possible velocity-oriented system that they had, and they put this sparkle on top of it. Hmm? Because what you see here is not an implementation. This is just a language, right? So I'm saying I want to give this power to the user. Then, I mean, the underlying system can be anyone that complies to the semantics of, uh, of this system. Huh? And uh, other people also attempt uh, to, to do it uh, in a sort of... Um, mixed way. Uh, so for instance, the group in Galway, what they did, was they took uh, their own uh, homemade RDF store, which is called Yars, and they had the parts in memory and parts on disk uh, system. They use the part on disk to keep the static knowledge, and they keep the part in memory to use the stream, and they add the streaming operator to Yars. Mm? So these are all different solutions, but all of them solve the problem. Mm? And now the point is, uh, how do you know which is the best one, right? So, so, which is still your, your question, but that is an open question. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> just one more follow-up question for that. Um, do you create indexes at all? Yeah, we do. So when, when triple comes in, we normally uh, create this standard in-memory in index that basically create the graph. No, no, the Gina in memory is, is much more simpler because, you know, the problem of index on, on disk is that it's a file. So you must run through it. But when you have memory, memory can have pointers. Yeah. So basically, you, don't, you just need uh, the entry point and then you navigate it. So Gina d does it in a very nice way. There is a paper by, um, I forgot the name. <laughs> you, you know the author of, uh, of Gina, right? Okay, I forgot. But you go, you look it up, and it's very easy. And if you want to see something better, there is a work in Oxford, which is called uh, 
RDF Fox, if I remember, and that is even smarter because they, instead of doing what is done in Gina, that is uh, somehow not, uh, uh, is, is written in C++ first, okay, and they control the allocation and they keep it in the best possible order for deduction. Whereas Gina only keeps it in the best possible order for query answering. Hmm? So th that will be even better. So uh, when new data comes in, they put it in the, in the way that they minimize the number of ops to deduce something. So the findings are that you can model RDF streams, that you can extend the syntax and the semantic of Sparkle to continuous query, and that you can do the same. You can give a semantics to reasoning, and what I call it is a continuous deductive semantics. So you have the window, and you materialize the window. Like it or not, okay? you may not like it if you start thinking about it, but that is what we did here. So now that you have the models, uh, you, you need to show that they work, right? So that is <laughs> the most important point. Uh, so what we did was, first of all, we check the, whether it makes sense in reality to build the system like the one I described. So you have an in-memory uh, RDF graph, you window it, and then you, query, you do query answering on top of this in-memory graph. And this graph is showing that it, it pays off, right? So this is uh, the cost of uh, computing the window on top of time represented as data. So you say, this is a tweet and it's tweeted at this time. This is another tweet and it's tweeted at this other time. And your task is select the tweet between this and that. Okay? So the larger is the window, the more it takes, and it is a sort of a, a polynomial in that way. No, it's a, an exponential, sorry. And these are the times. Okay? using a completely different data model, which is the one that we use. So you, you keep a linked list of, of the different uh, models, and what you have to do is a new model come in, you attach it on one side of a linked list, a model come out, goes out of the window, you drop it. Okay? So basically, the selection is always read the data in the models, nothing else. Huh? And you, have, you just have to do a constant operation to add the model and to drop it. Huh? And yeah you can see that uh, that is, of course, linear, right? Nothing, nothing more than that. It's a very known result, OK? So it's, it's nothing that uh, surprise uh, you, because it's known from databases. The cool thing is, is that even if you materialize the content, you still have this as a performance, right? So th that is a good uh, result that we, we got out of it. Um, what about reasoning? Okay, because th that is a, is a bit more complex, right? So if you want to reason on top of this, the best uh, of the algorithm that you have is called DRED, which is uh, pretty simple. It says, um, if uh, you have uh, something to delete, okay, imagine that you have this uh, graph, and these are transitive properties, okay? If uh, it happens that you have to delete this, what the algorithm says is, uh, okay, probably you have to delete this. Okay, because one of the reasons why there is the deduction is no longer true, so probably the deduction is no longer true. Then second step is uh, re-derivation. So now that I know that this may be deleted, I check whether there isn't any other path that will bring this back. Okay, so you go back with this in mind and you say, is there another way to derive uh, C to A? Oh, yes, there is. There is this path three, so I don't have to delete it. Hmm? And then you still have to do the insertions. Hmm? So if you think about it, maintaining a database, this comes from uh, view maintenance, 90 something, 80 something probably. Hmm? So uh, this is very hard because it means that you have to reason to delete two times, because first you over delete, then you find all the possible re-derivation. And that is only deletion. And then you have still have to do the incremental, the, the addition. Okay? So basically, if uh, you have uh, exponential complexity to do one reasoning, this is at least three exponentials okay, to do it. Um, now, the point is, what happens and why that, it, that works in practice when you have a database? Okay? Because every database has the red inside, and it works perfectly. So the point is that if you draw such a thing, this is uh, the change in terms of the size of a database, and this is the time it takes to maintain it. 
if you take a look uh, to the red, okay, he has more or less this behavior. Huh? So for very small changes, it is order of magnitude faster than recomputable materialization. And the larger are the changes, the more this uh, becomes higher. And there is always a point where it no longer pays off to do it incrementally. Right? Th that is always there. But in a database, most of the time you insert data. Huh? Is a very strange operation, the deletion. Hmm? Think about bank accounts, transactions. You store them. Yeah? Then you sum them up, and that is the view. Okay? But okay, normally you just have to increment the sum, increment the subtraction, and then you still have to do the two things, and that's it, right? So the amount of changes that are really going through over deletion and uh, rederivation is terribly small. And that's why this commercially works basically in every database. Huh? The problem is that when you apply this to streams, huh, deletion are always there. Uh, because you keep receiving new things and things keep throwing out of the window. Okay? So of course you are not happy uh, because it means that uh, if you have a slide of uh, two seconds over a window of uh, half a minute, it's already going to, to crash uh, your algorithm. Uh, so you better rematerialize. You, what you want probably is something that has uh, more or less this behavior. Uh, so you expect it to go up. It will never be possible to, to have it different, okay? But at least you want to bring this a bit farther, okay? That, that is the kind of idea. So how can you do that? The, the first thing that pops up when, when you start thinking about it is, but DRED doesn't know when deletion will appear. They are completely random, right? So that account is changed, that transaction is deleted because it was uh, not a good transaction. But I mean, th those are completely random. You cannot predict them. But here, we have a window. When things come in, we know when, when they will exit, right? It's, it's always the case. Right? Just take this as an example. Right? So this is a window which is 14 minutes long. These are the things that comes in. Okay, as soon as uh, you have this triple in, you know that it will exit at this time, right? It's, alre it's already known. It's, it's the side of the window, okay? So deletion in these settings are, are not unpredictable, right? They are perfectly predictable. You know that uh, something enters, it will expire in a time which is the, the side of the window. And so what we did hmm, was coming up with an algorithm which is called EMARS that is uh, somehow basically taking this as a first assumption and doing the rest uh, according to it. Uh, so the basic idea is uh, you have these barrels of data that, con that are maintaining the linked list and dropping them is uh, one simple action. Uh, so if you can put what should be deleted there when the things come in, you know that deletion is just uh, a look up uh, and, and drop, nothing else. Then, what you need to do is to be very careful with these annotations. And so you have to annotate uh, the information that comes in with uh, uh, expiration time. And what you do is basically you put uh, the minimum between the, the expiration times of a deduction. And so if I have something that uh, entered at, uh, at uh, 10 and something that entered at 10 past 10, the time for the uh, closure to be deleted is 10. Because when A, B will exit, also the deduction should be dropped. Okay, so when you do this uh, labeling of a deduction, you always have to take uh, the first that will exit as an expiration. Uh, so, you, so you take the mean. And the second point is you may have multiple derivation, and they may have different expiration time. In that sense, you keep the max. Uh, so the one that will be there is the one that will be there in the end. Right? So th that is the kind of algorithm. It's pretty simple. And it does what it, it has to do. Okay? So these are experimental results. As you can see, it remains uh, order of magnitude better than uh, materialization for quite a while. And then, of course, it stopped doing it because uh, changes become too large. But that maybe is OK. Right? So, and to show you that then it makes sense to use it in practice for query answering, these are for 2% changes. Uh, the results comparing backward reasoning, which is also an opportunity, right? So you don't materialize, but when you have to answer the query, you reason on the fly. Okay, so that, that is one possible way. 
and it takes that month. This is uh, you materialize with DRED and then you do query answering. Okay. And this is you materialize with Emers, which is, of course, an order of magnitude or two order of magnitude less, and then you do query answering. Okay. So in some of these settings, uh, it, of course, makes sense. Uh, because query answering on top of materialization is very fast compared to query answering on reasoning on the fly. And if you can reduce the cost of incremental maintenance, then you have done. Okay. Of course, there are papers that describe it if you want to learn it more. Eh? But this is a key intuition. So we reuse it in many other papers that we did where we were thinking about uh, what is the single principle that we have uh, discovered here. And the single principle is deletion are predictable. Uh, that is the point. So the finding here is that if you want to do the optimization, you can somehow do it. And you, what we did was learning from what was done in the database community. So our Sparkle engine is fully built uh, on uh, existing technology. There is Esper in front, and then there is Gina after. And the two things together do Sparkle. And Emers is a good example of uh, continuous incremental reasoning. Huh? There are other examples that are done with different techniques, but this does the job that he has to do. Going to what uh, <laughs> Professor Chef want, wants to do much better than me, and actually probably does, uh, the noisy and incomplete information. I have to admit that this was something that I only treated once in my life, because <laughs> I, I really find it difficult for, for my skills okay, to, to work in, in this area. What we did was working with a group uh, in Siemens. Uh, Forker Tresp is uh, one of the best known guys in machine learning. Okay, and what we did was coming up with this architecture that somehow says um, sampling techniques, uh, load shedding techniques, uh, they work uh, as is on noisy data. Hmm? And there are also outlier detection, o all of them work out of the box, so let's use them. Okay, so we do noise reduction when data comes in as much as possible. Then we have our, as I told you, Sparkle, which is basically built with the SMS plus a reasoner. Okay. And here we do whatever deduction we can to fill in the holes of incompleteness. So there might be missing things. There are stuff that are implicit in the data that you can get out of the model. We materialize them. Okay. And of course, we are materializing even, even stupid stuff. Okay. That, that's for sure true because you are reducing noise, but not necessarily you are pushing it completely out. But then what we do is, uh, in order to have some answers, we push everything into machine learning. Hmm? And here what we are doing is for uh, a social media analytics task, which is a recommendation engine that try to tell you, you should go to see this movie. Okay, that is the specific paper that you read there. Okay, so the idea is I take the social media input, I materialize it and I deduce whatever I can from what you, what you stated. Okay, so you say, I'm going to see, um, what was the avatar, OK? And then our system will say it's going to see a 3D movie, it's going to see an animation movie. So it, it creates basically all the possible deduction out of it. Hmm? Then all those possible deduction go into a, a, a matrix, which has user on one side and choices plus uh, characteristics of those choices on the other side. Hmm? Then these metrics uh, are inductively materialized, and what comes out our probability that uh, you will do some actions, right? So in this sense, you will pick up uh, another 3D movie and so forth, okay? And what we sh we're showing here is that if you combine the top K from here, okay? So which is the best movie I should go, take the hyperfet into account. So the one that everybody's going to see is the right one, okay? So that is... The, the kind of continuous answering that we were getting from the deductive part. Plus, something that comes from a learning that you did over a long window. Okay, so you take a, a, a year of data and you learn a model for every user that is good enough. Hmm? Plus, what you learn if you consider a shorter window. If I remember here, it was something like uh, one month. Okay, so this is one week, this is one month, and this is uh, one year. Hmm? You combine them using uh, Mm. order aware techniques, sorting, uh, as mm, ranking algorithms that merge ranking lists, okay? What it comes out is that you get very good results. 
very good result. You go uh, above uh, most of the baselines. Yeah. yeah. So where do you get the, the data that has come about something new? So here, this, uh, this work was done on something that you may remember. It was called Get Glue. You remember it? It was uh, a social network that was supposed to be in your browser. And it was going to do uh, social recommendation across websites. And so it was there spying what you were doing. It was creating, basically, Emanuele is looking at the page of Avatar. Okay, And then there was a public stream that you can subscribe to that was coming to us. And that was the first time we, we did anything in this direction. It was very cool because uh, many data were there. There was a knowledge base that was accessible. So they even built a knowledge graph uh, at back in those times so with all the movies, all the books. I mean, it was pretty rich. And it allowed us to do uh, a lot of interesting uh, um, tasks. But later on, we did it uh, in Korea for a, um, for a company. It's called Saltlux. And uh, we did it for a restaurant recommendation based on, uh, on Twitter. It's uh, published in a paper which is called Bottari, if you remember it. The year after, we won the Semantic Web Challenge with it. We really built it. Huh? The system was uh, commercializable. The only thing that they discovered was uh, building the knowledge base of all the restaurants was too expensive. So that is something that we learn every day, right? So we need open data, and we need very good open data, because for the data economy, rebuilding every time this data set is too expensive. Right? So, and now we, we have it as uh, one of the possible uh, products of, of a company. It's still not uh, good enough for, for, for what we want to do, because what we discovered is that when you, you do it for events, you don't have enough history. Okay, so you are completely missing uh, this one. And with uh, a short term plus the top K, you don't predict enough. So what we are doing now is we are going back on Twitter, fetching the last uh, thousand tweets uh, of uh, every single user, and then we build uh, a model of a user, and we try to use the model of a user to, to recommend together with this. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with you, right, about this idea. So. But that is probably the only thing you can do, right? So if you lack enough history from the current thing that you want to predict, you need to go back and back it up with something else. Is the comparable, even though they are yeah, that's they are, the problem. Yeah. Are yeah, even if the events are recursive, they are not comparable. If you think, I mean, we have been trying it for large events like the Milano Design Week, and. Year after year, they have different venues, different events, different people. And we also try it out for a, an event which is called IRM UK. It's a business event with hundreds of people coming to it. But every time, different people come. So somehow, that makes a completely different situation. So, whereas in this Korean example, it was very easy. So the, the Korean company did the crawl for three years. We had the full data set for three years. And it was incredibly easy to do it in this way. So, The other one is called Bottari, B O. Yeah. It's published in uh, JVS and it's published in Semantic Web Journal, an extended version with stagionality analysis and a bit more stuff. But I have a question. Yeah. Even though you ex ex um, extend the data set, like, uh, let's say I have a, 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 a one week event, uh -huh. I take, like, Twice the data for the same uh, same window time window, but mm -hmm. I you know take much more data doesn't doesn't work any anyway. Yeah, but the event is over. Yeah, I understand, but I mean. No, 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 no. By the end of the event, you are able to predict. Normally, we saw we saw that by day three of the event, you are able to predict quite nicely, but day three is too late. I mean. Imagine that you have an app that is supposed to tell you where you should go. By day three, you know where you want to go, right? I mean, you have explored the event enough that you know these are the things that I'm missing, right? <laughs> so that's why it no longer pays off. The point is, when people come, they, they like to, to be guided. And so it really pays off to be able to do it as soon as possible. So when, when it's late, of course, there is just very many things. This one? This one is recommending venues. That, yes, that's another paper if you want to read it. Uh, 
and it is in uh, sentiment computing. Yeah. So you have the profile of people attending the conference or the event, and then you have descriptions of venues. Yeah. You're trying to match those people. Yeah. It's a bit more, the machinery is a bit more complex than this because uh, one task that we do with the deductive stuff uh, is uh, suggesting uh, to this uh, profile builder people that may be good candidates for the, for the recommendations. So we take those that are very active on Twitter, those that are uh, choosing a variety of venue. So we, we, we choose those that are best candidate. And then that, that part of the, of the system goes on Twitter, downloads stuff, and does what uh, <laughs> the, the job of Pavan, basically. But with much smarter things. Less smart things, sorry. I mean, our stuff has, is very dumb. So it's, uh, it's basically considering all the possible entities, ranking them by frequency, and your profile, your vector, is uh, the, 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 all, the, the, all the things you are talking about uh, with the frequency, nothing else. It's a vector which is something like, 1,000, 2,000 entities. Yeah, that's okay, it. can be something like abstraction over those. Yeah, I believe that that is, is mandatory. We tried out, I, I was discussing with him uh, what to do, and we tried out things like spreading activation, but uh, we didn't cut <laughs> the graph. <laughs> and so our spreading activation was activating too much. And uh, when you uh, activate too much, then you have a risk that your learning system will not have enough uh, points uh, to do good predictions. Huh? So there must be, um, so the, the basic of this um, approach is here you have a user, here you have the items to predict, nothing else, and it works. Then you can add more columns uh, with um, categories of the items that you want to predict, and that will help. But if uh, the number of things that you want to predict versus the other stuff that you enter is uh, too unbalanced, then you no, it, it no longer works. And so if you have to predict uh, 10,000 things and you are putting a, a hundred extra category, the hundred extra category help to learn. If you put one million category, they create a lot of noise and you learn more or less uh, the profile instead of the links that you want to predict. So. Okay, so what's the finding that uh, uh, somehow very naively combining what a, stream re a, a data stream management system can do. So you can do um, outlier detection, noise reduction, uh, sampling with uh, good properties, and deductive reasoning. And in the end, you inject everything to machine learning, so you don't expect that to be the answer, right? So you, you put the machine learning system after it, then somehow the entire machine does proper work. Okay, so that is the finding that uh, I can claim. And practical cases, okay, I was talking about them already. So Botari was the first time we really built a complete system that was working end to end. So it was listening to Twitter in real time, doing uh, the recommendation in real time, providing the recommendation in a usable interface. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the entire chain was done. Okay, that was the first time we did it. Uh, after that thing, I, I've been working a lot with uh, Telecom Italia, which is the national company uh, of telecommunication in Italy. And what we have been trying to do was to do uh, data fusions for city. Okay? So try to collect as many signals from the city and fuse them and making sense of them. I will try to tell you something about it later on. And uh, now, what we have is this Fluxido, uh, which is uh, a company that tries to, <laughs> to, to build some money out of, of these kind of ideas. Uh, that is it. So I claim that there are <laughs> some situations where it makes sense. Okay? Most of them I found in social media analytics. Okay? So I cannot say that uh, the work that we did for Stato, the work that we did for others, were as successful as this. Okay? So the other were nice experiments, they show good results. Most of them are unpublished because they were commercial uh, projects that I got, and so they didn't want uh, us to publish. But I mean, indeed, uh, they were good enough. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, I was terribly happy, but uh, they were also small scale if compared to, to the others that I'm showing here. And so I, I was funded quite nicely for this Bottari and this city data fusion and uh, the other stuff. 
Okay, that's very the wrap up. Probably you got it fully. Yeah? So we, we did our dev streams, we did continuous park, we did uh, the continuous uh, uh, deductive reasoning. Then uh, we optimize it in a way that it works. And uh, we built a system that uh, through a nice combination of state of the art can treat incompleteness and noisy, but it's not rocket science. And uh, we show that there are applications where this makes sense. If you want some open issues, I believe that uh, nowadays these 1,000 more or less people that are working on stream reasoning, uh, the semantic web way, are in a kind of terrible situation. Eh? Because most of us really want uh, to do practical applications. Okay? And on the other side, one look at it and says, I'm not happy with the theory. Okay? It's, it's, most of this is crap from a theoretical perspective. Yeah? And I really believe that Abram Bernstein did a very nice title to the talk that he will give uh, to my workshop uh, at the ISWC on Monday. Uh, he, he said, uh, navigating the chance between the Schilla of practical application and the Caridis of theoretical approaches. Yeah? That, that is really where people that is trying to do more RDF streams, more CSparkle-like stuff, more continuous deductive are in, in the moment uh, stuck. Uh, everybody wants to do something that is motivated by reality, but in the end uh, you perceive that there is uh, something in the theory that d doesn't really work. Yeah? Then, with regards to the second point, yes, I, I believe that uh, we show that string reasoning is feasible. Other did it as well. There are at least five different implementations that use completely different solutions, as I was uh, saying to you. Um, what, uh, Somehow, I don't think uh, is uh, the correct way of doing, which goes back to the theoretical stuff, is uh, there are very strong assumptions. Huh? First of all, the knowledge does not change. So the ontology that you put on top of the system is there and is not going to change. And there are many situations where the ontology may change. Hmm? For instance, in the work that we are doing with IBM Dublin, we are learning the ontology from the data in continuous fashion. And then we want to do continuous deduction. Uh, but if the ontology changes, you can no longer do it with EMARS. Hmm? So somehow you have to rethink completely the, the, the paradigm here. And if you wonder what we are learning, we are learning causality relationship in traffic. And so events, network topology, how uh, congestion cause other congestion across the city. And so that is not something that you can ask experts to write down. You have to learn it from the data. So this ontology is a model of uh, how traffic in Dublin creates other traffic. That, that's the idea. And the second point is background data. So these are uh, other data that are sitting aside. Normally they are said to be static okay, and small because they must fit in main memory together with the rest. Okay. These are things that we were discussing last uh, lesson on velocity, right? So these are limits of the velocity. They are not really limits of uh, the stream reasoning. But still, you have to solve it if you want to bring this uh, to a different level. Huh? So people in my group are also working in removing the assumption that uh, the background data is static and removing the assumption that you can take them uh, close to you. So they may be remote. You may have a cost to access them. And still, you want these reactive answers uh, to, to take place. And the last thing is the Ricardo thesis, <laughs> which uh, I really love to do query writing. And I don't think that uh, it was done correctly. And the reason is that, uh, as you saw yesterday, the variety in the system that we want to target is very high. Uh, yesterday, you saw that there is a functional model, an operational model, a distribution model. And all of them are not covered at all by the standard theory of, of ontology-based attacks. So somehow you have to extend the theory in order to bridge also all these different execution semantics eh, that go beyond query plus data equal answer, right? So query plus data plus execution semantics is answer. Mm? That is uh, the strange thing here. Then uh, the incomplete plus noisy thing that we did, I believe is nice as a piece of engineering, but what's the theory behind? Why does it work? When does it not work? Okay, th th that is clearly a question that one wants to answer, and I don't think we did at all, right? So it works because it works, but uh, when, under which assumption, uh, that, that is a different uh, thing. And in the application, that's another piece of <laughs> Ricardo thesis. I really believe that we are missing rigorous uh, um, evaluation. And so if you take a matrix of uh, approaches, 
and you look which are compared with which, this is a very sparse metric. Okay? So basically, the, the matrix is with few comparison. There are no benchmarks that are accepted by everybody, and th that is clearly a lack for the community. Yeah? So something to, to work on. Advertisements, you won't believe it. I, I took my PhD thesis 20 days ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, I started in industry and then I became a professor, strange enough, okay, because I don't have a PhD. And then suddenly I said, how can I give a PhD to people without having one? And so I decided that I should have one. <laughs> but the good news for you is there, is there are two chapters in my thesis. Okay, introduction and conclusions that basically say what I said today. Okay, so if you go on that link <laughs> and you read uh, the introduction and the conclusion, you basically have this talk written. Okay, more or less what I said. So what do you think? Do you really need to give PhD? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, <laughs> no, but uh, maybe I, sh I should switch that off, right? <laughs> No, but uh, there are kind of fundings and there are uh, kind of jobs that you cannot access if you don't have it. So that's maybe not the, the best reason for you to get a PhD, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but still is one. <laughs> so yeah, there are formal reasons to have it. Yeah. And that's my page of stream reasoning. So if you click on I like it, uh, we'll be happy. So I give now room to, to Ricardo to, to give more details on CISPARCOL and if you want to, to understand how it works, it will give a more practical talk. Okay. 